Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of Military Mutterings where we have a bit of a special for you. Now you're probably wondering, this isn't the little friend thing you spoke of last week? Well yes, that's because we decided that we would give you something far more interesting. So this week, I, Jack Fletcher, and my good friend, me, Kevin Janssen, shall discuss the V-Force, the Valiant, the Vulcan, Victor. So Kevin, tell us a little bit about what came for the V. Well, the the V Force, well, the V Force wasn't really a thing back then, but the plan to make new jet bombers started in November of 1946. So just a, a year, almost two years after World War II, and the British at this time had the I think the Avro Lincoln, the improved Lancaster in service. Just sort of keep, keep that in in your mind. Like it's it's a good bomber, but we're way past World War II now. They need something jet powered, and the atomic bomb of course made its debut as well in Japan so they needed something new now and before any of this V force was a thing there was the plane called the short SA4 Sparin this is a funny looking jet bomb if you ask me and had four jet engines sort of like wing mounted in the cells now the reason why I bring this um, plane up is because that was actually sort of a fail safe if any of these bombers you see before you have the Valiant, the Vulcan and the Victor if they couldn't be built because of any sort of reasons, they were going to fall back on the Sparin, which was a much more conventional design. Now, in the end, um, two Sparins were built, and of course the V-Force very much became a thing, so the Sparins were not needed. So the Sparins were used to test out different jet engines that were later also used on the V-Force, if I'm correct. So it was a very vi a vital part of the V-Force, even though it wasn't really one of them. But if you are wondering what a proposed bomber version of the Sparrow would have been, well, it would have carried 20,000 pounds of bombs. So I think it's just in the form of 21,000 pounders, just conventional bombs, nothing nuclear. But still, I think it's a very, very funny plane to talk about. But yes. yeah, that's the Sparrow. And now I think it's going to, going to give it to you, Jack. Yes, well, before we, uh, before we get over it, slide, the V-Force itself consists of the Vickers Valiant, which first flew in 1951 and entered service with the RAF in 1955. It's the, the, plane, you, it's the plane you see in the middle. <laughs> That's the yeah. Valiant. The, as you can see, it's got more of a, I suppose you could say, conventional H swing design. Well, it's got more conventional wings compared to the others. Yes, then you have the Delta winged Avro Vulcan, which first flew in 1952 and entered service with the RAF in 1956. That's the one at the bottom. By far and the most iconic have, one of the bunch. And then you have the swept winged Hanley Page Victor, which also first flew in 1952, but entered service with the RAF in 1957. By the uh, time of 1964, however, the Valiants were removed from service due to uh, metal fatigue in the wings and the uh, planned low-level variant did not progress past the prototype stage and all and usage of all the V-Force as bombers including nuclear or conventional ended in um, ended in 1982 just after the uh, just after the Falklands conflict now if Kevin goes on to our first slide, we have the Vickers Valiant. Now, the Vickers Valiant, according to BAE systems, had well, a few different variants. You have the standard B1, uh, the uh, which had 39 builds, and then you had the uh, Valiant B PR Mark 1, which had 8 builds, which was a bomber. Uh, photo reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, same with the, because uh, that was the uh, Type Seven Ten, and then you had the Valiant B T R Mark One Type Seven Thirty Three, which had thirteen built. And this wasn't just bomber and photo reconnaissance. This was also a tanker. Now, what you'll see with all three of these is that they all became tankers. So they did have very long use of service. Well, two of them did anyway. 
but then you have the Valiant B Mark One uh, Type Seven Five Eight, which was a bomber tanker, and the tanker variants have the proof system in the bomb, which would allow for hose and road aerial refueling systems. And then you had the Valiant B Mark Two, which was a bomber only. Now, specification-wise, you're looking for the Valiant a maximum speed of 567 miles per hour at 30,000 feet, um, had a capac uh, capacity of 5 crew plus uh, 2 additional crew in the tanker roll, and it could carry either a 10,000 pound bomb as per the original specification, or 21 1,000 pound bombs or a pair of 1,615-gallon or imperial-gallon fuel tanks in the bomb bay. Keep in mind that this source comes from BAE system. And the range uh, for, for the underwing tanks was, I believe, about 4,500 miles. Well, something, so we, something I should yeah? have probably mentioned in the beginning, I forgot about that. When the original specifications were made for the bomb for, for these bombers, stuff like the Grand Slam twenty thousand pound bomb and the ten thousand pound tall boy were also still considered. So you'll see a lot of sources saying that these planes um, would have carried a Grand Slam or a tall boy, but in reality they only carried the one thousand pound conventional bombs or a nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And the ten thousand pound bomb that I talked about, I believe, was a uh, was a uh, yeah. yeah, it was a nuclear bomb, correct? Yes. Right, so if we go on to our next, we have the Avro Vulcan. By far the most iconic of the three. Mm. Um, first, of course, uh, of course, uh, mainly due to its actions in the Falklands conflict from Ascension Islands all the way over to the Falklands, uh, thanks in part to Vulcan XM607. So, the Vulcan. It was, well, you had a few different variants. Uh, first and foremost, you had a pair of prototypes built, uh, XB770 and XB777. Uh, you had 45 B1s and 89 B2s. Now, I believe that the primary difference between the... Uh, B1 and B2 is uh, that the B2 had uh, larger, thinner wings and were fitted with better engines, uh, just to uh, name a few things, as well as radar warning aerials on the uh, Pearl Fin from, I believe, 1970s onwards. You had the B1, which was your standard initial production aircraft, the B1A, which was able to carry uh, electronic countermeasures. They're the B2, which has the larger, thinner wings. Uh, then you have the uh, the B2 MRR, which stood for Man Maritime Radar Reconnaissance. Uh, the K2, which was uh, a air-to-air -air variant. And the <laughs> B3, which was the proposed version intended as a long-endurance missile-capable well, missile carrier capable aircraft. However, none of these were, none of the B3s were built. Do you happen to have some weaponry for the proposed, like, anti air one? Uh, it could carry be six Skybolt ALBM. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's that. Now, as a specification for the standard B2. You're looking at, well, a uh, speed of 644 miles per hour, range of um, 4,600 odd miles, and a payload of 21 1,000 pound bombs, I believe. Yeah, I think it's, well, it's either 20 or 22, some, somewhere around there. Yes, and of course, uh, nuclear capability. Now, see, this aircraft was, I believe, I th well, it served a good life. Um, 
it uh, served, say, during the Falkland conflict, which is where it was the most famed for, aside from it being a Delta Wing jet bomber. I mean, if we look at the Valiant and the Victor, they were quickly changed to tankers, while the Vulcan actually stayed as a bomber. And in the Falklands War, the Victors were refueling the uh, Vulcans when they went over to the Falklands. Yes, uh, which was uh, rather intriguing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a topic we can cover in another video, that's... yeah. <laughs> yes, so Kevin, if you would like to get on with the... Uh with the next member of the V-Force family. Yeah, the Victor. Well, if we compare the Victor to the previous one, the Vulcan, it might not look as much of an improvement, mainly because it doesn't have a Delta Wing anymore. But the Victor was actually very technology-focused. Um, it was very advanced for, for what it was, really. Now, the Victor, uh, we, we have two separate versions of, of this one. You have the B-1, which was the first production version and we've got the b2 Now the b2 actually differs in that um, they needed to have higher altitude performing bombers i think this was mainly because of the russian threat with the anti-air missiles they sort of realized well our high altitude bombers need to go higher <laughs> in order to stay safe mm. and then of course they just realized you know what we don't have any yeah, anymore, <laughs> so we'll just go low altitude to keep yeah then safe. they realized well th th it's no use going higher but anyway, so the B-2 actually had more powerful engines and slightly longer wingtips. So which uh, extended the um, total wingspan to 120 feet, which is 37 meters. Now, what I like about the Victor is, I'm actually going to go over to this next slide right here. From the beginning, the Victor was really bomber oriented, if we look at it. So the conventional bomb load of the Victor was 35 1,000 pound bombs mounted in the bomb bay or a Yellow Sun free-falling nuclear bomb. And we can see the 35 1,000 pounders in the um, drawings at the top, so the side one and the two front and back um, profiles. But now, when you look below it, we see some other interesting things, and these are wing-mounted nacelles for additional bombs. So whereas the Valiant and the Vulcan had around 20 1,000 pound bombs, the Victor could carry 35 in, ter in the internal bomb <laughs> uh, bomb bay, which is already nuts, and then you could carry an additional 10 on the wings, so 45 1,000 pound bombs. That is crazy. And actually, if you look at the very bottom photo, it's cut off a little bit, but that is actually a proposal to also mount a, I believe it was a tall boy, a 1,000 pound bomb in each one of these nacelles, so two oh, of those in the wings. you mean a 10,000 pound bomb? Oh, sorry, yeah, 10,000 pound bomb. Mm. But that is... This was never fitted to the plane, sadly, but <laughs> I think it's a very interesting thing to keep in mind. Like, if they actually wanted to go full out bomber um, conventional bombs, they could have done this. But yeah, the Victor. Imagine, imagine if World War Three broke out and you just saw a bunch of Victors screaming down for, uh, an enemy runway, dropping a pair of tall boys each, and then dropping their 35 conventional bombs. <laughs> well, they would have probably had one or two uh, tall boys in the main bomb bay as well, so you just see four of them heading your way. Or mm. a grand slam in the main bomb bay, and then two tall boys in the sides. Oh man. Mm. But yeah, the Victor was um, the last one of the V Force to go out of service, and it went out of service as a tanker. Because, uh, like, we, like we said with the Vulcan, the Vulcan sort of stayed as the bomber, and the Valiant became a tanker very quickly, retired, and then the Vulcan took over the Valiant's tanker role. And as the tanker roll, I believe the last one was put out of service here in 1993. That is yes. very, very modern, if you think about it. Yes. Now, all three of these aircraft saw service in terms of their conventional bombing role. Mm -hmm. The Valiant saw service in Egypt in the Suez Crisis. The Vulcan, of course, saw service in the Vulcan's conflict. And the uh, Victor, uh, whilst I don't believe it uh, dropped any conventional bombs, were used as a deterrent in uh, 1964 to 1965 uh, during the um, uh, Borneo conflict. Oh, yeah. So think... they all did see role. They all did sea service, as I said before, 
in their conventional or in their fuel tank variants. So all three of these were indeed somewhat successful in doing what they did. Well, I think another cool thing to mention, the Vulcan and the Victor actually also had a lot of proposals drawn up to make a supersonic Vulcan and also a supersonic Victor. I believe it was going to be called the Super Victor at that point. So there were a lot of plans for these bombers, but in the end, well, I think only America is operating big jet bombs now, oh, yeah, and Russia, of course. But for Britain, having big nuclear jet bombers was just not necessary anymore. Mm. With the uh, introduction of multi-role uh, supersonic fighters, like the uh, Jaguar and the Tornado, yeah. it, it just became completely redundant, really. Rather than having this large lumbering subsonic target able to be shot down quite, well, rather quickly, let's say, by both surface-to-air missile batteries, standard AA batteries, and enemy aircraft, you would have these far smaller targets that could carry respectable payloads, especially in the nuclear aspect, or even just the... Um, or even in a few of their number in the small strike force will be able to carry enough ordnance to equal one of these bombers. So really, it just wasn't worth it in the end. Alright, well, um, I think we're going to round it up here then. Or do you have yes. something to say? Uh, well, um, I don't really have anything to add unless you have anything to add, Kevin. No, I don't. Well, in that well case, I'd say we should... go research them yourself because they're a very, very nice su subject. Or very interesting yes, planes, if I'll say. They are actually, and there are numerous uh, on display in museums around the United Kingdom. So if you live in Britain and you want to go and see an example, uh, I would visit the Imperial War Museum in Duxford because, well, they used to have all three of them uh, in the. Uh, they used to have all three of them on display, but I think a couple of them went in for restoration. So. Yeah. I really need to visit to Britain again and visit those museums. <laughs> oh, Duxford is a brilliant museum as a the tank museum at RAF Cosford. So if you want to see some rather exquisite vehicles, please do visit those three. You will not be disappointed. So, on that little happy note and that little bit of advice, we shall see you all next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.